I was, yeah. So I, I came here to the library the night of it, and it was uh, it was interesting. It was, you know, December cold, blowing snow, very big, thick flakes. So you know, the, my first thought was, how are they going to get the mummy outside without getting him all wet? Being in the Egyptian room, and Hen is behind in a case behind glass, and they took the glass down, and it was immediately. This smell filled the room, pitch and tar, I think. It kind of smelled like, you know, the old wrappings and the wood of the coffin, and it just kind of smelled like history. And it was amazing because, you know, I've always looked at the mummy, I've read the books, but when the smell hits you, that kind of makes it real. They took him out, they wrapped him kind of in protective wrapping, put him on a gurney, and took him out to the county coroner's van. And we transported him from the library in Casnovia to um, Krauss uh, CAT scan room. People were showing up and some hospital staff were like, oh, what's going on? I'm like, oh, well, there's a, you know, a, a mummy, the local mummy is coming in to be tested. And I'll never forget one said, really? I thought that was a joke. <laughs> I said, no, there's a mummy coming in. <laughs> Everyone was fascinated. They wanted to know. And, and half of them were like, what's going on? Someone said there's a mummy here? Like, yes, yeah, right over there. Went, what? And then people were taking photos on their cell phones and after the tests were done, <laughs> I thought it was great a couple of the doctors were taking selfies, of, you know, as is laying on the CAT scan there. Word had gotten out that there was a mummy in the hospital and it was like a celebrity had walked through the doors. Everyone had their phones out, they were taking pictures of him and just documenting because many people hadn't realized that there was a mummy here in Casanova. We have a mummy, yes. Um, I count him as one of my co-workers, and he has been here for over a hundred years. Well, the museum's a little um, different, <laughs> and most, li most libraries don't have museums, but we're very, very fortunate that our library's had a museum since 1894. Uh, Mr. Hubbard is the man who gave us this building uh, in 1890, and he decided we should have a museum too. He loved his community, and he wanted to better the community and help the citizens to become better citizens. Hubbard was part of a tradition uh, of people that went on a grand tour. Uh, they would tour throughout Europe uh, and end up in Egypt and other places. Uh, American tourists uh, all wanted to have, you know, kind of their picture taken by the pyramids. So during the 19th century, um, there was a fad, uh, the Egyptian revival, and it extends out of uh, Napoleon Bonaparte's uh, uh, conquest of Egypt. Egypt became the craze. Everybody wanted to read about it, learn about it. This was at a time when uh, Egyptologists were making a lot of discoveries in the Valley of the Kings and the Nile region. All of the findings, the jewels and the gold and then the mummies and the tombs of kings were being printed in newspapers so the world was fascinated. And this is the first time really that the Western world gets to see uh, semi-accurate uh, images of Egypt. So taking the grand tour of Egypt was the thing to do for wealthy um, people who had the money and the leisure time to do it. Most Casanovians are not going to be able to travel the world. So his goal is to purchase objects, bring them back. There was a large race uh, to see which museum early on could carve up the largest quantity of Egyptian antiquities, statues, monumental uh, items. Uh, and so all of the tourists that were on this grand uh, expedition uh, not only wanted to see their, you know, a picture taken of them at the pyramids, but they also wanted to bring home a piece of something, a piece of Egypt. The Cairo Museum had a beautiful exhibit at this time, and Mr. Hubbard refers in the diary to going to the uh, museum twice and looking at the beautiful mummies, the really beautiful artwork. Those were being kept in Cairo in the museum but uh, the sheer number of mummies that were being brought out of the tombs allowed these shopkeepers to just sell them. So Hubbard's journal uh, discussed uh, the fact that on one of his days, he traveled south about 20 miles to a place that he refers to as Hilwan, and it seems through an intermediary uh, source, he was able to secure a mummy uh, by the name of Hen. Um, this mummy probably came across the Nile from the Memphite region. The people who are doing the selling know nothing about what they are selling. 
They're not Egyptologists, they are not reading the hieroglyphics, they're basically plundering the tombs and then selling the objects. Uh, Mr. Hubbard actually bought two mummies, one so he could unwrap and see what was inside of it, because often they had jewels and statues and gold. So one was unwrapped in Egypt while he was there. And uh, apparently when they took the last layer off, the body just basically disintegrated from the modern air hitting it. Hen arrived in Casnovia in 1894. Uh, he really wasn't ready for his public appearance to 1895, early 1895. And at that time, there was a fundraising tea to welcome Hen to Casanovia. Um, so Mr. Hubbard had done a lot of research on Egypt and mummies and wanted to share that with the public. I think the, the library and the museum are a really integral part of Casanova, uh, and preserving history is a big part of our mission statement. I think it really connects people, gives them a window to the past. You know, in a library full of books, you can read about the past, but then if you can walk down the hall and go into the room and, hey, here's all the past right here, right in front of you. As soon as we started um, working on uh, education programs, we re realized we needed to learn a lot more about Hen and he has always been such a object of interest for anyone visiting the library. And the more we learned, the more questions that were raised, and the more we realized that the average visitor into the museum needed some background. In the 40s, in the 1940s, someone knew someone at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, and the local photographer took pictures of the museum, of course they were black and white, and mailed them to the Metropolitan who um, kind of examined them and told us that Hen's name, they uh, translated the hieroglyphics and said his name was Hen. The problem with that is the foot has broken off, uh, which prevents us from reading the full name of this individual, so he's Hen something else and we're not entirely sure what that would be. He has very intricate wrapping pattern. If you compare him to our cat mummy, which we believe is 5,000 years old, it's just a simple round and round sort of thing. And it's that woven pattern that helped the Metropolitan Museum of Art in the 1940s identify when Hen was living. Because just like our clothing style changes, the way they mummified changed and one piece was the way they were wrapping, putting more artistry into the wrapping pattern than jewels and things underneath. We decided to reach out to the medical community because we were all very curious. The more that you work with Hen, the more you wanted to know. I mean, you, you really felt like you knew this person and you wanted to know where did you live? You know, what was your lifestyle like? Why did you die? How old were you when you died? And these were all the questions that children had when they came in and adults had. So Dr. Levinson, who was the head of radiology, arranged for a CAT scan at Krauss Community in 2006. And so they contacted me and asked if I could tell them anything more than they already knew. Uh, they thought that it was a, uh, a middle-aged elderly woman uh, they, they didn't know the cause of death uh, or whether she had any medical illnesses. So we did a CAT scan and we were able to see um, many, many features of a hen's body. For one thing, we recognized almost immediately that hen was a male, not a female, and that it wasn't middle age. It was actually a person who was somewhere between 19 and 25. For about 100 years, a hen was thought to be uh, a woman uh, rumored to be a princess, uh, which of course is completely untrue. It was Hubbard's uh, kind of eccentricities uh, that allowed for this kind of assumption. I think it's more wishful thinking than anything else. Uh, and that's certainly what he was sold, is a female mummy. And a female mummy he did not receive. After telling children for 20 years, Hen is a woman, we had to reveal that Hen is actually a man. And uh, that it was very clear in the CAT scan that everything was preserved, is how we put it. <laughs> we found a, a mass uh, in Hen's uh, right leg on the surface of or very close to the fibula, which is one of the two bones below the knee. And based upon its appearance, which I would back up from my years and years of experience looking at other such lesions, 
I think this represents a uh, primary malignant uh, bony lesion. Periosteal uh, sarcoma is what I think it, it represents. It's my great hope that the biopsy that we did will actually show enough cellular material so that the pathologist can agree with that. Um, and if so, then that would be, I, I believe, the first time that um, this diagnosis uh, or any cancerous diagnosis of bone has been shown both on the x-ray and in histology. We, we know he's got this mass in his leg and um, he also has what's called mus muscle atrophy on that side, which means that if you stop using a limb, the, the muscles get smaller. And if you start using it and work on it, well, of course, your muscles get nice and bulky. Well, his, his muscles on that side were slightly reduced in size. And I believe that the reason for that is that he wasn't using his leg fully. He was probably hobbling on his leg, maybe he even used a cane. If we're really, really lucky, it'll biopsy will be um, positive. And then we can say, uh, this, here we have what we feel is a cancer based upon its x-ray appearance and we even have a name for it, and we can prove it with the histology, that hasn't been done yet, uh, anywhere. And so um, our chances are, are there, but they're, they're not high. So we have this CAT scan from 2006 that is showing evidence of a malignant tumor. The fact that there is enough tissue left that he has preserved so well that we can see this soft tissue disease after 2,000 years is just amazing. Especially related to cancer and certain types of diseases, there's very little known. Um, so that'll be very interesting and those findings uh, will have a lot of significant impact, uh, presumably on Egyptology and archaeology and kind of our understanding of how the Egyptians lived at the time. Well, I am a former scientist, used to be a cell biologist, and so to me, Learning all of this for someone who lived thousands of years ago is absolutely fascinating. I love the art, I love the tradition, and the, um, the fact that this, this procedure, these procedures were done for thousands of years. You know, that is all incredibly interesting. But right now I have to say, I am awfully excited about the new technology and what we're learning because of that new technology. To be able to study people who lived thousands of years ago without disturbing their body is fascinating to me. I think as a developmental trend, uh, as people are kind of applying uh, new medical technology to ancient individuals, uh, we're gonna get a much fuller picture uh, of exactly what their lives were like uh, what kind of diseases they suffered from. I think people are using technology because it, it, gives, it opens a new world. I mean, it attempts to answer these questions. And this is part of uh, a hot debate, not necessarily whether or not Hen actually had cancer, but whether or not the same types of diseases and cancers existed in people in the past as they do today. We're exposed to different types of chemicals and different things in our modern world that does make it plausible uh, for that mutation to occur that will lead to uh, cancerous tissue of some sort. Um, but there's no reason to think that the same diseases that we suffer from today haven't always been indicative uh, of human populations. Uh, it just may be exacerbated uh, to some degree uh, by our current type of lifestyle and exposure to certain new things that we wouldn't naturally be exposed to uh, in kind of your ancient environment. In learning how he died, you really humanize him and helps us to really understand what his life might have been like. Um, hence, hopefully gonna have a little bit more of a story as we learn more about him. And um, we can fill in the details and place his, his importance in not just our history, but Egyptian history as well. I think that he's a mystery. Again, he used to be an Egyptian princess a hundred and some odd years ago, and now we know that it was a man, that he walked with a limp, that he probably had a very caring family because of how well he was preserved.
Um, his CAT scans are revealing every day. I mean, we might even learn something new in this next round. Um, but we, that he's always teaching us something. He's part of the Casanova family, and that's exactly what would have happened in an Egyptian tomb. The family would have come and they would have given offerings. There would have been members of the cult that would have given offerings. You, would, you know, because it's not just this, you don't stick somebody in the ground and then walk away. It's, it's part of a mortuary cult to kind of give this energy, to give these offerings to the individuals. And if that's the case, then he is certainly, you know, a member of the family still, so. Yeah, and I think it's true. Even people who move away, they come back and... People go, and, oh, well, the mummy's still here. <laughs> Bring their kids and grandkids to see the mummy. We're very fortunate to have, uh, especially in central New York, uh, kind of any bits and pieces from the ancient world um, for educational purposes, uh, for kind of our celebrated kind of overall global cultural uh, legacy as a, as a species. I think Ken will be admired for the next hundred and something years. I think people will be, he'll always be a treasured citizen of Casanova. He is treasured and there's a great pride when people have visitors coming from out of town or all around the world. One of the things they do is bring their family and visitors to see the museum, especially him. I would, I think that Hubbard would, um, yeah, I think he would be thrilled with the coverage and the exposure. He was a man who understood that he was um, very privileged to be able to travel and to acquire artifacts, so that's why he created the museum. And he definitely would be in favor of information. I mean, it was all about giving out information, providing information for people. And uh, he would be thrilled, I think, to know that his little museum and his, his mummy, you know, is that information of traveling around the world. Hen's future is going to be here in Casanova. Um, and hopefully he's going to have a greater recognition. Not just local school groups will come, but people will come to Casanova because we have a mummy, um, because we can tell that story. The fact that there are children uh, and people that are visiting the Casanova Library, uh, there are people that are thinking about Hen, investing energy and effort in Hen. I'd like to think in some form uh, or another, it's causing him to continue to live. And that's part of a kind of a lovely tradition. And that's something that I think any Egyptian uh, would love. Whether they anticipated being in a museum on display, um, I don't know if that's the case. He probably would prefer to be in a tomb. Um, but uh, I think this is the next best thing. Uh, that he continues to live at least in our in our minds uh, and thereby he continues to have at least some form of an afterlife. I think everyone who works with Hen probably has a little bit of a different idea of his role but I know as a museum educator for me Hen instills curiosity no matter who comes into that room? It could be a four-year-old who peeks in and then runs out because he's fright, you know, pretends to be frightened and then comes back in because he, he has to look, you know, he has to be curious about it. To, you know, all ages of people. And you find when you're working with Hen that initially people are curious about the wrappings, that they'll question about the wrappings or maybe the death mask or the detail on it. But very soon, the questions start to be about, well, how old do you think he, he was when he died? Do you have any idea why he died? Now we know those answers, but those are the things that people are curious about. The person, Hen, you know, not, not the artifacts, not the trappings, but who was this person and how did he live? So for me, that's, that's what's important about Hen. He's a, he's a great vehicle for, for curiosity.